My new book, Peace Over Pain, is now available. You can buy it for $20 on Amazon or you can download it for free inside my exclusive Facebook group. Simply go to peaceoverpain.com slash join the group. And between the group and the book, you will learn how to eliminate chronic conditions. Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. Do you have peaceful living? Welcome to episode number 156. Today, I'm talking with Roberta Hughes. She's a coach that focuses on meditation, yoga, and Pilates. She helps people to live a more peaceful existence. Before we begin, sit down and relax and take in this important and beautiful conversation. Roberta, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Kevin. So what are three ways to declutter our thoughts? The first is your breath. Your breath is with you all of the time, no matter where you are or what you're doing. Mm. Simply by pausing and taking a purposeful inhale and exhale, that just wipes the slate clean. When the brain is focused on the breath, it's not able to think about all of the things that are filtering through the mind. So the breath is number one. Number two is to use some kind of a planner where you can write things down, get them out of your brain, and organize them in a way that feels manageable. Mm. And then the third is mindful movement. When you move your body and connect that with the breath, And with your awareness, it helps to center the brain Mm. and those thoughts subside. Yeah. I love mindful movements. A lot of times you start to feel it right in the hands, you know? (laughs) I saw you starting to work with the energy there. It was like (laughs) you could feel it. (laughs) Why do you think so many people are stuck in their head? Hmm. It's the easiest place to get stuck. Um, Mm. I think as we grow, you know, as children, we're not in our heads at all. But as we become more conditioned to society, to being in school, to expectations from our parents, our teachers, later our bosses, we start to close ourselves inward and only think about what's happening between our two ears. And we lose connection to our environment, to our sense of self. And that causes us to keep in that spiral of thinking all of the time. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like the levels of anxiety and depression that humans have now is probably, and I'm taking a guess, but it's probably a new phenomenon. I just can't imagine like native americans or vikings or barbarians or you know people in the roman i mean people far back having panic attacks you know because they're under they're they're so used to doing hard things right and i feel like now technology has kind of made us dare I say weak? Yeah, you know, I think that's one way to look at it. But also, when you look back in history, even just to, I'm, I'm 49. So just looking back to my grandparents era, how much they got out into nature, how much they walked to the places that they needed to go, Mm -hmm. how often they grew their own vegetables and harvested their own vegetables. There was so much time and patience and care putting into what it takes to survive and live a healthy life. Mm. 
mm-hmm. that you didn't have time to just be idle. And being idle in front of a screen, the screen creates so much stimulation for your brain. Mm-hmm. So the brain is on alert all of the time, which you know triggers our flight or fight. Mm -hmm. And then the nervous system kind of gets confused and it doesn't know how to regulate itself anymore. We have to be intentional about diving into practices that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system so that we can remind our brains how to rest. If we don't take time to rest, our brain forgets how to do that. And then it's stimulated all of the time and it takes very little to set it off into those anxiety and panic attacks. I don't think it's because we're weak. I think it's because of how we're wired. Yeah. I would have guessed that you were 29, Roberta. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) It's all that mindful living, right? The peaceful living. Yes. Um, Why do you think, so you... I see the word Zen here. So I I have to assume that you've gone deep into the Zen culture and the Zen tradition. I have not gone deep. Most of my mindfulness training is actually in Tibetan Buddhism. I love the word Zen because it's a word people associate with. I think anytime a person sees that word, it creates a feeling in their mind. So my Zen breaks are really designed to bring you to that state of quiet and mindfulness and calm, even if it's just for two minutes before you go into the next part of your day. Yeah. Yeah. I see you have the, uh, the five minute Zen. Yes. My Uh, Zen breaks are anywhere from two minutes to seven minutes. So five is kind of the average and it's just a short guided meditation. And I like to call them Zen breaks because you can pop them on between Zoom calls and you really just need to listen. You don't have to look at the screen. You can take them on a walk and listen to them. You can sit in the carpool line. Um, So many people are at Starbucks. I just, I always have to wonder who has time to sit in the Starbucks line and wait for 20 minutes for a cup of coffee. But if that's something that you do, you can pop on a Zen break in the Starbucks line drive through and listen and feel better before you leave the drive through. Absolutely. Yeah. So what attracted you to Tibetan Buddhism? It's a very mystical tradition. So I just happened to have teachers that were in the Tibetan Buddhist faith. I am a Christian. So Christianity is where I practice from. Mm. And in my practice, I feel like the tools that I've learned through meditation help me hear God in a different way. That's my personal practice. Uh, What I love about Tibetan Buddhism, uh, I study with Sarah Powers and learning how to become quiet, learning how to be with what's uncomfortable, learning how to recognize the thoughts that spiral around in your brain, those cycles of suffering that we get stuck in because of the thoughts that we entertain within our own heads. And that creates human suffering. That's mm. those are the things that I brought away from the Tibetan Buddhist practices. And so you're a mindful Christian. It, it's <laughs> kind of rare. Yeah, it's kind of rare, actually. Um, I like how over the last ten years or so, mindfulness has snuck into pop culture a little, and because it's called mindfulness we can get away with it no matter what culture we're in because if you did if you said buddhism a lot of christians would be like oh no 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 (laughs) no 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 (laughs) or or muslims or whoever uh but when you say mindfulness it's more accepting it's more universal it is you know words can really trigger a person's ability to hear or resist or receive um, information and mindfulness i think because there is science behind it people are more open to exploring what it could be like to practice mindfulness and and that that, see that's that's the awesomeness to me because i always go back into history and and just think about how advanced 
you know, the Buddha was, Gautama the Buddha, like, he was, it was science. He was, he was laying science on people. <laughs> yeah. And here we are 2,500 years later, like, uh, let's call it mindfulness. And <laughs> you're right. Yeah, whatever it's scientific words work. Thing. Yeah. Whatever words work to help a person understand that what we're looking for is a way to regulate our system, to remind our system how to rest, mm. to come to a place of nourishment and rejuvenation. Those are lost arts because the way that we live in our world today, everything requires us to be going and moving and going and moving. So slowing down on purpose and being intentional about that, that alone is mindfulness. Absolutely. So what got you into all, all this? Cause you, you also do yoga and Pilates. It's very interesting. We got to take care of the, the muscles and the spine and all this. So usually somebody ends up in pain or of some sort, and that's what brings them sort of through the holistic health journey. Is that what happened to you? Somewhat. Uh, I grew up as a very active child. I was a cheerleader and a gymnast in my younger years. And then I found yoga in college. And it was yoga that really transformed how I felt. When I walked out of my yoga class, it was palpable the way that I felt. And mm -hmm. nothing active that I had done my whole life had ever inspired that kind of a feeling. That's what really stuck with me and what got me interested in yoga and we would dip into some some pieces of meditation during that time, but we were really studying the Iyengar method, um, how to align the body, how to use our breath, and how to move in a way that created healthy patterns of movement. Later, um, having been a cheerleader and a gymnast and then a yogi, I was very flexible, but not very stable in my body. And once I started having children, I had two children who are now grown, but um, after I had my second child, my back went out on me probably for the third time. So the first time I was 19 years old, the third time I was flat on my back for about 10 days, mm. thinking I would never hold my children again, or even take them for a walk to the park again. Mm. So I didn't really do anything other than what I knew for a few more years after that. It was about five years later that I was working in a fitness center leading their yoga program. And they also wanted me to lead their Pilates program. And I'd never had an experience with Pilates. So they put me through my level one training. And from that point on, I never had a problem with my back. So I, I didn't seek you it out, your but core, I felt, right yes. So as you know, our bodies need that harmony between flexibility and stability. If you're too unstable, that puts too much wear and tear on the joints. If you're too stable and rigid, then that puts stress on the joints because you don't have the flexibility to bend and move. Mm. So I felt like the two practices together just created that harmony in my body and gave me the awareness to be able to move with confidence. So now when I feel things shifting or going in the wrong direction, I know what to do to bring things back, whether I need to stretch more or mm -hmm. offer more stabilizing movements. Absolutely. We do the same thing in postural therapy. It's the same yes. concept, you know, yes. once you know the body, uh, even you don't even have to know it um, on the micro level. I mean, just the, if you understand the concept of, pulling and pushing and, uh, and finding that stability, like you said, then it takes the fear away. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my neck hurts. Okay, just need to do this. Yeah. You know, and whereas a lot of people run to the medical system. You know, yeah. End up under I, the knife. <laughs> yeah, I think surgery should always be the very last choice. Um, but so many people don't have the body awareness and body awareness comes with mindfulness also, mm -hmm. because you have to dive into what you're feeling and experiencing and be with it to understand what is helping and what is harming. 
Now, when you were down and out for those 10 days back in the day, I would have thought it was just five years ago because I thought you were 29, <laughs> but what, what, what type of feelings were you experiencing? Uh, was it helplessness? It was fear. Um, because I was such an active person my whole life and everything that I did with my children, my youngest was 14 months old and um, just walking. He's now, he just turned 20. So that kind of gives you an idea of how long ago that was. And um, he was just barely walking. And I, I loved being a mom, like being a mom was probably the best job that I've had in my lifetime. And mm we would go to the park, we would take long walks every day. Um, so my youngest was 14 months, my oldest was almost five years old. Um, we would throw the baseball, we would go to the beach, we lived in California at this time. And um, I would have them on my lap reading books, I would read to them at night, and I couldn't do any of those things for 10 days. And so I was in fear that I would never again be yeah. the mom that I wanted to be and be yeah. there for my kids the way that I wanted to be. I wasn't as fearful for myself as I was for how am I going to parent these two little boys. Um, my ex-husband was in the Air Force and was gone most of the time. So I was almost a single mom most of the time. Mm. Um, so it was the fear. It was the sadness. I remember a lot of grief. I just sat with the grief. Um, and let myself cry and let myself imagine that this would be the best that it's going to be Yeah, and try to make peace with that. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting experience. I've been there. Yeah, I have a friend right now who is kind of going through it. He just um, got bit by a tick and got Lyme mm. and he is, is homesteading. And if you know anything about homesteading, it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work. You know, you got acres of property, you got a lot. And all of a sudden you're sidelined, yeah. your, your joints are swollen. You're, you're laying in bed and it's like, okay, well, who's going to take care of the chickens? Who's, who's going to mow the lawn? Who's going to do this? And what happens when it snows? Oh my gosh. Ah. It's like when we get sidelined, and we can't perform life anymore. It brings about a certain darkness. It does. And it's not even really who's going to take care of these things. It's the mourning and the grief of, I can no longer take care of those things. Yeah. And having the desire, like realizing how quickly things can change and shift and how impermanent and precious mm. Um, our gifts are in the world. And oftentimes we don't recognize our gifts and recognize our abilities until they're taken from us, even if it's for a short amount of time. That's right. And isn't it interesting though, that when we're two, three, four years old, we don't care about taking care of anything. <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> mom, mom, live life. <laughs> mom makes us lunch, right? Like, yeah. you know, it's like, but if you can't, you know, when we're older, it, that grief, yeah, you're right. Loss. Mm -hmm. Loss can please. send you. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Please. Loss can send you right down that, that dark, that tunnel of the dark night, you know? Yes. I was going to say it's that domino that leads to depression. Yes. So. What is a daily ritual and why do you need one? A daily ritual can be really whatever speaks to you in terms of self-care. So when you think of a daily ritual, how are you taking care of yourself today? Do you have something set up in the morning? Do you have something set up in the afternoon, something in the evening? I have all three, but I've developed those over the course of many years for someone new trying to create a daily ritual, maybe it's as easy as waking up and saying something of gratitude before you get out of bed, making your bed, then getting yourself ready for the day. That could be a ritual. 
it's a practice that you do over and over again that brings the brain to a place of comfort. So there's a lot of comfort in rituals. If you think back to our grandparents tending the land, growing vegetables, those were rituals, things that they did over and over again. It allows the mind to come to a place of calm so you're not having to think about what's next. Um, an afternoon ritual might be that you make a cup of tea and go sit under the grass. That's what I do, or under a tree on the grass to eat mm -hmm. your lunch. So almost every day during the summer here in Denver, you can see me in my front yard with my two dogs, bare feet, sitting on the grass and eating my lunch. Um, an evening ritual, maybe an hour before bed, you decide to leave your electronics to the side, you mm. dim your lights. You put on um, some soothing music or essential oils. You take a hot bath. So it's not necessarily what you put into the ritual. It's how it speaks to you to help you come to a place of peace and calm. And one day the ritual will be taken away. One day it could be, yeah. <laughs> And that's where it's important not to become too rigid with your rituals. So I know when I travel, my bedtime ritual is going to be different right. um, than when I'm at home. But I have certain things that I can bring to evoke those places of comfort within me, no matter where I am in the world. Mm. So you had mentioned that uh, you work with uh, people with disabilities. I do. Now, tell me about that a little bit. So in 2013, one of my clients hired me to work with a young woman who had Down syndrome. And every year, her and her husband would sponsor one person that they wanted to help impact their life in a positive way. Prior to that, I had never known a person with Down syndrome um, personally. I had seen people with disabilities, but I had never known a person personally, nor had I worked with them professionally. And this young woman was um, just over four feet tall and weighed a hundred and, oh no, let me remember, 202 pounds. Yeah. And she was obese. She wasn't very mobile. Um, it took us about a year and a half, but over that course she, of time, she lost 108 pounds mm. in us working together. And when I first started with her, I remember telling my client that I'd never worked with anyone with a disability and I didn't know what I could do. I'm not a nutritionist, but I do know what it means to create healthy meals and healthy habits around food. I knew Pilates and I knew yoga. So we kind of worked in three month increments and she went from being very disabled to being able to do three sets of stairs during her workout where her very first time going down the stairs, I had to brace her body weight and it took us about 10 minutes to get into my basement where I would work with her. So that experience changed my life and it really helped me see the pure love that a person with a disability brings to the world. Because when she became frustrated, she was frustrated. When she was joyful, she was joyful. She didn't have the filters that normal people do um, in kind of masking what they're truly feeling. And her purity and her mindfulness, if you will, was just so refreshing for me, even the days that she was cussing me out. Like I knew she was angry at me, but then two minutes later, she loved me because then she was feeling successful. So seeing her emotions just come through her lit my heart up, you know? And so from there, I actually started a nonprofit called the Healthy Me Project. And I helped partner um, people with disabilities with volunteers, and we did workouts in big fitness centers because our vision was to have people with disabilities be able to walk through the doors of a fitness center and feel just as comfortable and confident in their workouts as any other person, mm. and to bridge the gap between the fitness industry and people with disabilities because 
having been in the fitness industry most of my life, like I said, I had never had the opportunity to work with someone with a disability. Since COVID, we have really had to um, back down in how we were offering our program. And we did go virtual during COVID. So now I still teach a weekly Pilates class for some of the people who are connected to the program. And we work on Pilates, which keeps them um, really strong with their memory and Pilates, classical Pilates. Um, we work with memory, memorizing the order of exercises, the setup, the execution, and then of course the form and performance of those movements help them in all of their day-to-day -day activities. And they've all gained confidence and social skills. We do a lot of communication where they get to tell me how they feel, what they learned. Mm. So it's one of my favorite things of the week. Is now someone with Down syndrome, that, that purity, isn't it very similar to that of a, a child? Yes, it's very mm. innocent and loving and pure is just the word that comes to mind for me unfiltered unfiltered yeah and w do you find challenges with with doing nonprofit work because ra oh. raising money is always a oof. yes so raising money is the number one reason we aren't operating in the way that we used to um with covid because we couldn't do our fundraising for about two years um it really put a stressful financial impact on the organization and we climbed our way out of that but i just i i lost the heart to try to go back and rebuild all of that financial support so that we could run again in the way that we did in the past how does your mindfulness impact your ability to deal with failure <laughs> mindfulness helps me know when i'm feeling like a failure and when i become aware of feeling like a failure then i can do something to alter it sometimes i just sit with the feeling of feeling like i have failed and then i can kind of step back and look a little more objectively um, where did the failure actually occur? Mm. What was within my control? What was not within my control? And where am I adding more suffering by the things that I'm saying to myself in that moment? Right. Yeah, because sometimes we get too attached to the outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you were just talking about with, uh, you know, trying to raise the correct amount of money and blah, blah, blah. And then all these things happen yeah we have no control over anything <laughs> <laughs> and let the only thing we have control over is how we're going to receive or resist the things that come our way in life yeah now i like to say we have control over lunch <laughs> as long as we're an adult and we're not like in jail or something yeah that that is something we have control over but who knows what happens between now and lunchtime <laughs> <laughs> right right who knows it could be a storm there could be whatever you know well this just happened to me a few weeks ago i had painters at the house i don't know for whatever reason it just didn't dawn on me that they were just gonna make the kitchen completely unusable and I go down for lunch, which is my breakfast, because I, you know, I fast for the first half of the day. I go down. All I want is to make lunch, and I can't use the kitchen. I'm just like, okay, wasn't expecting that. It, and it you happens. have no control over lunch. So how did you feel in that moment? I was fine. You know, it, it's just the hunger creeps in, and it's like, oh no, you know. So, you know, I made it, I made it happen. That's all right. Yeah, we you have, managed, you yeah. managed to find something to eat and it wasn't a horrible. Yeah. I had to go, I had to go to a restaurant, which I never do. Okay. I, I suppose if, 
if I went to restaurants normally, then it wouldn't have been a thing. But for me, it was like, ah, oh, okay, I got to break my little rule here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and did you feel okay with breaking the rule? Yeah, I had no choice, really. Yeah. And I think that's what we do with the things that come our way. We either resist and get really upset about it and we can't see an option to solve yeah. the problem in front of us or yeah. we receive the conditions and think about, okay, if not this, then what? What is possible? Now, earlier you mentioned ex-husband. Yes. How did you deal with divorce? Because that's a big, that's a big to do in someone's life. It is a big to do. So it was 2016 and it was not expected by anybody. It was me who asked for the divorce. Um, and really that came from me not vocalizing over the course of many years what my needs were and how to get them met. Um, and I would say on his side, not having the ability to communicate at the level that would have provided the opportunity for me to share in that way. Um, and if we go way back in time, we can say it's as simple as I was 19 when I met my ex-husband. Mm. He was 24. Neither of our brains were fully developed. You were just a kid. <laughs> And we got into a relationship and got married when I was 23. I had my first son at 25. So, you know, a full fast course of relationships and then parenting and all of the stresses that life brings and then mm. add in the Air Force and moving and reinventing your home every three years. We never really had the opportunity to find out how our relationship worked and how to keep it healthy and alive. And it finally came. I did a really good job of doing the best that I could. I think he did the best that he could, but they just weren't matching up. And I finally couldn't do it anymore and hold up the facade that things were great. So mm -hmm. I tended to share the highlight reel with my friends and my family, only the good parts would I talk about. And I kind of buried those harder parts deep down and I protected my children from them as well. So when I finally had my voice, it took a lot of struggle to get to the place of saying that this is what I want. So a lot of my pain and heartache came prior. And then once I said it, it was a little bit of courage, a little bit of courage. And then there was a lot of resistance on the other side. And I would say it was like a storm for about two to three years as mm. we transitioned through that process. Yeah. The the word that calls out to me is courage because 2016, uh, if my math is correct, that takes you back to your early forties mm -hmm. and you know, that's middle age. I mean, to get divorced, you know, in your forties is it takes courage. Yeah. And our 20 year wedding anniversary occurred about two weeks before the final papers were signed. That was hard. Um, but I think that experience working with Brianna, the young woman with Down syndrome is really what manifested my courage because I felt so much joy working with her, even during the hard moments when I realized that that joy also wasn't in my personal life and I wasn't feeling joy in my day-to-day -day living, I needed to take another look. And is that how I wanted my life to be for the rest of my life? Yeah. So that puts even more meaning on this encounter with this uh, young lady with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. hmm. How hard is a hard decision. Gosh, that's the question. Um, <laughs> if I look at the decision 
about my divorce, I would say it was gut wrenching. It was heavy. It consumed me. Um, I went back and forth struggling and trying to choose the best thing and looking at the best thing for my children, not just for myself. Um, but then ultimately choosing what was best for me and hoping and praying that they would be okay with what I was choosing. Mm. Yeah. There's other people involved. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a big decision. Yeah. yeah. Big decisions are hard. My, my method is to come up with the worst case scenario and make it okay. And then make the decision. Yeah, I think that's a great approach. And it sounds like maybe you approach things more from a thoughtful process where I'm such an empath that I feel things at such a deep level that it's more for me, can I be with this feeling, with the heaviness of this feeling, with the discomfort of this feeling, with mm. all of the ugliness of, you know, the feeling of making a big decision that could have consequences, not just for yourself, but for others too. So I had to feel all of that before I could actually vocalize, okay, this is what I want. Like I was able to feel it. I was able to experience it. It didn't break me. Yeah. Now I have the courage to put voice to what I've been wanting and thinking and feeling. Right. And you have a 20 year old, 20 year old young man. To, my youngest uh, is 20 and my oldest is 24. So, yeah. 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 So you, you're taken care of. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how would you describe Pilates? to someone that doesn't know what it is? Pilates is an exercise and movement system to help realign your body and to help you develop concentration, centering, and control. We also focus on precision, breath, and flowing movement. Those three things come in later. First, we need to be mindful. That's where concentration comes in. So bring the brain into what our body is doing. When we become centered, there's the mind-body connection, but there's also an ability to move from the center out into the extremities so we have more stability and focus with each movement. Control, we learn to be in control of our movement, so we're moving specifically in a specific way on purpose to achieve a certain outcome. And um, Precision, we we partner that with control, making sure that we're precise in our movements and not just thoughtless in our movements. And then with um, the breath, the breath is a great tool. Joseph Pilates really emphasized a complete exhale because when you empty the lungs and you empty all of the waste from the body through the breath, you have no other choice but to fill it with fresh, oxygenated, clean, healthy air. And that really stimulates your whole system. And then flowing movement, because when we first learn something, we're often awkward and awkward and um, uncertain about how we're moving. It feels more mechanical. Mm -hmm. But with practice, with repetition, with that ritual and pattern of movement, over time, it becomes more natural. And that's where flow comes in. So you feel less like the tin man and a little bit more like a tree <laughs> floating in the wind, if you will. So how would you compare Pilates to yoga? Yoga also is a mind body practice. Uh, with yoga, we're looking more for the union of the mind, body and spirit. We're looking for ways to become quiet and connected to our true authentic self. So we're traveling from the layers from the physical body down into our spiritual body. And very many of the elements are the same. We do a lot of different breathing techniques in yoga. 
And um, we're Pilates, it's pretty basic, but inhale and complete exhale with yoga. As you know, there's pranayama, which offers many varieties of breath. <clears throat> and depending on the breath, it will speak to people in different ways. Mm. And so yoga, I would say, is more of a union, more of a connection to your inner authentic self. Pilates is more of a movement practice bringing mindful movements into your routine for a reason. Very similar to probably what you do with your postural therapy. Yeah. Yeah. We got to take care of this little vehicle we have here, huh? Yes. We only get one. That's the rumor. <laughs> so tell me more about peaceful living. Peaceful Living. In your practice, what you do. Yeah, Peaceful Living came to be in 2018. And it's a culmination of the things that I've experienced through my life. So when we talk about rituals, when we talk about yoga and Pilates, I started practicing these in my teens. And then as a mom, it was really a form of survival to figure out how to bring peaceful moments into my day. So that at the end of the day, I didn't feel completely wasted and unrested and learning to get sleep when I was able to sleep raising young children. So with Peaceful Living, I teach people how to create a self-care plan that really works for their life mm. and will fit into their daily schedule. Um, if they don't see where it can fit, that's where we start is looking for how can we create some space if your schedule is that cluttered and that tight creating space is the first step. And I use the combination of yoga, Pilates and meditation and help them create practices that they can do throughout the day, whether it's in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening. I have guided meditations to help people get a better night's sleep or even mm. just to restore and rejuvenate during that midday slump to re-energize instead of taking a nap. A guided meditation helps to give you that rest without leaving you feeling groggy and tired like a nap play. Before I ask you my last question, where can people come find you and uh, dive into your work? So my website is peacefulliving.com. Full has two L's. And right now we're offering a 30 day free trial. I have a membership community and it's 30 days free and then only $36 a month. And with that, you get a one-on-one -on -one call with me to set up your 30 day self-care success plan. After that, I will help you choose the videos that are going to work with you. So I have on-demand videos, more than 150 on-demand videos, plus live stream classes each week. People who need more accountability come to the live stream classes because they have interaction with me. People who are super busy and need the flexibility to plug things in, I give them links to on-demand videos. They pop them into their schedule and do those on their own time. I'm also on Instagram. So Roberta underscore peaceful living on Instagram. And then I'm on Facebook as well. Um, and I, always forget my Facebook handle. And then I'm also on LinkedIn, Roberta Hughes. Yeah, I think it's cool. We both got peace in our, in our brand names. Yes. Here. yes. And you just wrote a book. I was going to ask you about that and time just flew. So. Yeah. Peace over pain. Yeah. I love that title. Thank you. So you ready for the last question? I am ready. When's the last time that you cried? Oh, gosh, probably just a couple of days ago. Let's see. I cry a lot. My last memorable cry was when I put Noah, my youngest son, on the airplane. He's doing a semester abroad in Mexico. Uh, and knowing that I wouldn't see him until December 13th, like the ache of saying goodbye. Every time mm -hmm. I say goodbye to anyone I love, tears. <laughs> they just come up and it's just true grief and sadness for that goodbye, but then joy for looking forward to seeing them again. So you truly are an empath. Yes. <laughs> what is, 
I, I messed up. Here's one last question. Okay. What are the three books that inspired you? Three books that have inspired me. Um, Eric Schiffman has a beautiful yoga book called um, Moving into Stillness. That's not the complete title. I always mess it up. But Moving into Stillness was my first yoga book. And then Pema Chodron has a book called Making Peace in Times of War, mm. which I love. And then I'm a fan of Elizabeth Gilbert. So her Eat, Pray, Love to me was such a courageous way to tell her story and share about hard life decisions like we were just talking about. Yeah, you know, I, I saw the movie. Okay, you have to read the book. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a middle-aged woman getting divorced, right? It's yeah. Same kind of thing? Yeah. All right. Okay. And the book really dives deeper into her internal struggle than the movie really did. She ended up at an ashram. She did, yeah. Right. So she spent 90 days each, Italy, um, India, and then Bali. Yeah. Yeah, something happens to us around mid-age. I don't know why. That's why they call it the midlife crisis. Yeah, and you know, I feel like, I don't know that I believe in middle age, honestly, Kevin, but... <laughs> When I look back to my 19 year old self making these big decisions for my life at that age, I didn't have the capacity or the experience or the wealth of information to make great choices. And I think that's something for young people to remind themselves of, not to be in such a hurry to make permanent life decisions at that early age. Give yourself time to really figure out who you are in the world before mm. you connect to a partner or even a job. You know, my 20 year old son is like sometimes worried about what he's going to do with his life. And I keep telling him you're 20, just be 20, explore, figure out what brings you joy, figure out what you're passionate about, figure out what you're skilled at and good at. Mm. Like this is the time to really explore in those earlier years. By the time you reach your 40s, I think that's when you really know yourself and you know what your wants and your needs are and you can manifest those in a more purposeful way. Yeah. Yeah. And your 40s are your prime, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not going to be in your prime anymore soon. Oh, I'll always be in my prime. Age <laughs> is just a number. <laughs> and if we keep taking care of our bodies, age That's really right. is just a number. That's why I do really the things is. I do when I'm 60, 70, 80. I want to wake up. I know I won't feel like I do today, but I don't want to have knees that don't work and a back right. that doesn't work and all right. of the things. Yeah. And there's a proverb in, uh, I believe it's India, that you're only as healthy as your spine. Yeah, Joseph Pilates said um, we're as healthy as um, our spinal column or we're mm. as young as we, we are young as our spine is flexible. That's what Joseph Pilates said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, you, you don't want to be the, the older person that's hunched over and stuck. No. And I've worked with people in their mid 20s to early 30s who were so stiff and deconditioned that their bodies moved like a 60 year old. My mm -hmm. mom is 75 and she takes my classes every week and mm -hmm. she she does not act like a 75 year old woman who is hunched over and immobile and hurting all of the time. She has her aches and pains, but um, I, I think we are as old as we choose to be. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Kevin. It was wonderful. I didn't really know where our conversation would go, but I love all of the things that we touched on and I hope your audience enjoys it as well. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. 
Until next time, may peace be with you.